Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are in this world of ours. I truly hope you are happy and healthy. I'm Aaron David Miller, a senior fellow at the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace, and welcome to Carnegie Connects, a series of virtual conversations on issues of critical importance to America and to the world. Today, I'm really pleased to welcome uh, Polina, Polina Ivanova, a Financial Times investigative journalist covering Russia, Ukraine, and Central Asia, where her reporting is focused on Russia's invasion of Ukraine, developments inside Russia, from the Kremlin's crackdown to the impact of sanctions and Putin's attempts to evade them. Previously, Polina covered Russia and Ukraine for Reuters and joined the FT in 2021. The next year, she was shortlisted for the prestigious George Orwell Prize for Political Journalism. Based in Moscow before the invasion, Polina's moved between Berlin, London, and Moscow where she last visited in November of last year. Polina, I, a warm welcome to you. It's great Thank to have you. Thank you so you much. Carnegie Connect. We have much to discuss. Let me take yes. a minute to sort of frame at least one issue that I think is it's important. As the first year of uh, Russia's aggression against Ukraine approaches next month, the analysis and debate on the issue of the effectiveness and efficacy of Western sanctions uh, against Russia looms large. Not surprisingly, Vladimir Putin in a recent speech extolled Russia's capacity to manage the Russian economy despite the sanctions, claiming that for most of last year, Russia's GDP declined by only 2.1% when the experts, including some of Russia's own, thought the drop might be between 10 and 15, much more severe. The hope, of course, in the West was that sanctions would trigger a financial crisis, inflationary spiral that would bring the Russian economy sooner rather than later uh, to its knees. The fact that it hasn't, despite the enormous sanction firepower directed against Russia across key sectors, right? Finance, trade, tech, energy, and against the Russian elites, despite all of that, um, Putin has managed to manage, clearly, Part of the reason for that is uh, revenue from oil and gas, which has cushioned the blow, but also, I guess, grudgingly, I might add, smart management of the Russian economy has played a role, and you, you've reported extensively on that. Um, final point, but, but clearly, by, uh, by all estimates, however manageable what I would call the headlines are of the last year, by any estimates, the trend lines look pretty grim. Uh, most economists claim the Russian economy will face years of degradation, of contraction, and of regression. So let me start off with the 30,000 foot view before we get to the granular. Does that framing seem right to you? I know you're not an, econ an economist, but you deal with these issues. Yeah, it does. It does seem it does seem broadly right. Um, I think um, when we're talking about the effectiveness of sanctions, people look at them from different perspectives. So they set different goals for what they wanted the sanctions to achieve. And I think you did outline um, the primary one that people uh, were hoping for, which is, or I mean, I guess the West was hoping for, which is um, an immediate effect on the economy that would be sort of palpable, direct, there would be inflationary spiral, there would be, you know, I actually saw predictions of GDP drop even in sort of the around 30% right at the beginning of the war from economists abroad. So that was one expectation um, that clearly has not um, taken place. Other expectations were around um, sanctions creating an impact on public opinion, especially mm -hmm. among elites who uh, find their lifestyles changed, unable to go to Monaco or whatever to on their holidays, unable to... Um, you know, enjoy some of the kind of lifestyles that they had before, which were very embedded in the West, and also for the middle classes who would find, you know, that certain goods were no longer available, their, you know, trips abroad again would be would be limited. And so I think there was another expectation that sanctions would cause some sort of public opinion shift within Russia and make it more difficult for, um, uh, for Putin to continue the war. Again, we can talk about what it feels like in Moscow right now, and we can talk about how the middle classes are feeling and what kind of consumer goods are available and that sort of thing. Um, but I would say that for the time being, sanctions have not had a huge impact on either lifestyles or public opinion. Right. And the two main objectives, uh, Putin's capacity to prosecute the war on one hand and to pay for it 
I mean, I, I, I wonder even if the administration's um, expectations were, were, were that high. Um, no country in the world, with the possible exception of North Korea, maybe Iran, has been as heavily sanctioned. Um, the Russian economy certainly isn't as integral to the world economy as China, which gave the Russians some flexibility to lower expectations and create a sort of do-it-yourself economy. But do you think those ex expectations were unrealistic? Are we, have our hopes gotten ahead of, uh, of reality? I think um, it's not that they were unrealistic. I think that just um, in terms of the economic impact, they were, you know, those short term picture and long term picture. And I think in terms of the short term picture, perhaps those kind of um, views were unrealistic, though a lot of people now say ah, we didn't expect sanctions to actually have an effect immediately. Right. We understand that it is in the long run. I think when you're in Russia and a lot of people that I speak to there um, who, you know, they talk about this is a country of 144 million people, 143 million people uh, deeply integrated for three decades in the global economy and with, you know, a traditional, a tradition of, of ties to um, India, China and other parts of the world that are not necessarily, um, you know, fully uh, aligning with uh, the West on sanctions. So um, in terms of the short term, perhaps there was some over expectation from for what they would cause you can see that um in in uh especially when we talk about for example oil and gas revenues and those do make up almost half of russia's budget and if we're talking about how can russia fund the war you know the, most of the restrictions on uh oil and gas uh only came in later so uh in terms of boycotts in terms of oil price caps and that kind of thing so in fact, there is a recognition that this is going to take time if uh, for the West to achieve the results that it wants to achieve. So um, that this will be a longer term, slower process. And all of my reporting has shown um, that the, the main sort of impact of uh, sanctions, uh, import controls, boycotts by companies acting independently of sanctions is this kind of gradual degradation. Um, right of the quality of, of goods, of the ability of Russia to kind of develop its economy. Let's turn now to how Putin may have done this, at least at the macro level. You, you, you and your colleagues did fascinating reporting of one meeting in particular. I, I call it technocrats to the rescue. Maybe that was either even a, uh, a subheading in, in your report in the, in the FT. Uh, a month before the invasion, uh, Putin summoned or the economists, technocrats, I gather, requested a meeting with him. Could you take us behind the scenes and in some detail tell us what occurred in that meeting? Absolutely. And, um, and I have to also give credit where it's due also to my colleague, Max Seddon, um, who really got us inside the room on this one. Um, in January, uh, Putin held a meeting with uh, some of the key participants were um, German Greif, uh, the head of the state bank, Sberbank, and uh, Elvira Nabiulina, um, the central bank governor. And at the time they presented a, according to our sources, and we've seen this presentation, a 39 page presentation of uh, what they believed to be the possible impacts of, uh, you know, severe Western sanctions on the Russian economy. And, um, this included, you know, the, basically an expectation that if ha sanctions are super harsh, there will be um, panic in the Russian economy. They warned also over a massive, you know, GDP falling off the a cliff, basically, over the next two years. Um, and they talked about uh, the need to control rampant inflation with rates raised to, you know, something like 35 percent. Um, and the, the big dent being that real incomes, you know, the real incomes of the population could, could you know, shrink uh, by as much as a fifth, which would, of course, be felt by, you know, nor ordinary Russians across the country. And they were preparing this presentation, not necessarily, you know, in um, uh, thinking that a war was coming. And I really have to take us back to, to January 2022, when people could have seen the, the troops gathered around uh, Ukraine at that point and still struggled to believe that something so momentous could happen and so horrible. Um, and so they were more preparing a presentation thinking that Russia might claim to annex the People's Republics in, in East Ukraine, the so-called People's Republics of Donetsk and, and Luhansk, these, um, these areas. 
and uh, they were preparing for that scenario and the Western reaction that could happen. The interaction that happened then um, was that Putin indicatively didn't say, ah, okay, I've, I've, I've heard you, um, that sounds terrible, we won't do it. It was more of the lines of, okay, well, so what can we do to respond to, that kind of, to those kind of sanctions? What, would, what do we do if, um, you know, to prevent this kind of fallout? Which obviously indicated to the room that, that there may be, that war could be on the horizon or some of these events could be on the horizon. And um, uh, yeah. I mean, he ignored their advice. Actually, they were unaware of his uh, war planning. Uh, they were clearly. unaware of his war planning, yeah. Right, although they warned against, uh, I guess, in the event Ukraine escalated, then this bad news would, would take root. Um, now, the, obviously, they ignore, he ignored their advice, but he clearly depended on them to clean up uh, the economic mess that... Um, threatened as a consequence of, um, of the Russian invasion. Um, how effective were they uh, in, in managing this? I gather very effective, um, particularly the central bank governor. Yes, absolutely. Um, I think that's absolutely right. And, and it's exactly this, um, the, the core of our, of our uh, reporting was about, uh, as you said, the, the technocrats riding to the rescue. But these are, it's important to say, um, people who are always seen as the technocratic wing, the liberal elite, the kind of uh, the elite that believed in a free market economy and a globally, you know, globally, globally integrated economy. Um, and they stood in contrast to sort of the opposing wing to the seal of key, the more hardline security state, um, people who have, you know, a longer history perhaps of, um, sort of, or, or see themselves more in a kind of Soviet economy, perhaps. Um, so, for these people to go through the transition of um, first being against the war, being shocked by it, to then subsequently uh, putting in great effort to keep the economy afloat and making it able to continue sponsoring that war, this is the transition that we were really trying to get to grips with. You know, going from um, going from being horrified to the, about the war to becoming kind of its enablers, to becoming complicit in it. And um, they were very effective. In particular, the work of the central bank was incredibly effective um, to prevent that initial panic. So very quickly, they raised rates. Um, they introduced currency controls, meaning that you know Russians couldn't take um, money at the bank. They prevented a bank run. They prevented a lot of uh, money from leaving the economy, so they prevented capital flight, even though some of it still happened. They also prevented um, a massive exit of uh, Western companies and Western money, so they kind of froze Western assets as well. It made it very difficult for people to sort of cut ties with Russia and flee, sort of freezing the situation. Um, all of that was incredibly important. It also built on what Nabulin has been doing since 2014, which is very important, and we did, um, you know, a lot of reporting before uh, the start of the invasion on um, Russia's kind of war chest, its fortress, fortress Russia, the economy that being prepared in many ways for uh, this situation, um, creating, for example, an independent payment system to be less reliant, you know, um, creating things like Visa and MasterCard left the, you know, cut ties with Russia and yet people could continue using their Visa and MasterCard cards within Russia. So it, you know, they created a lot of systems that were sort of already preparing for, uh, for the worst. Uh, Nebulin also built up a war chest of Forex reserves, but um, a lot of that was, was frozen and was abroad. And so uh, that in also shows the degree to which she didn't ultimately expect sanctions to be quite so harsh because a lot right. of the war chest actually was then able to be frozen by the West. You quote one Russian official, I suspect this was tremendously self-serving, quote, uh, who said that had the Sloviki, the security and intelligence elite been in charge, the GDP might have been have fallen as much as 10 to 15 percent. But there's no doubt that he, he, Putin, used these people, relied on them, and essentially they uh, they delivered. Mm. 
Yes, absolutely. Though um, Gurdjieff also, uh, Sergei Gurdjieff, who's a, an economist at Sciences Po, also put it very well in in that in that piece that um, you know this is a, this is a central bank backed by riot police. So if you um, mm, if you tell you know if you told if you told him uh, ten years ago that uh, the Russian central bank would ban people from being able to take money out of the uh, out of the bank, that there would be riots and protests and people would be furious. Um, but there is no such response because there is also the you know the threat of the state. Right. Um, so I think the the dynamic between the Siloviki and the and the um, and the technocrats is a complicated one, but. Um, I think it's clear that that is how the technocrats justify um, their actions to themselves. It's the idea that um, ordinary Russians will uh, suffer from, and, and, and this is very true, and uh, that grandmothers will not receive their pensions. You know, people will suffer, people who, um, you know, the ordinary Russians would feel the, pain, the economic pain. Particularly, there is, you know, a, a large proportion of the population is, um, under the poverty line and would be hit incredibly hard by um, by an economic downturn. And I think that's how they justify it to themselves. Um, yeah. It's a moral debate, I guess. It's a good transition for us. You um, you were last in Moscow in November. Um, yeah. And I, I believe the essence of your reporting that life basically continues on the econ economic side pretty much as normal. McDonald's is gone, um, replaced by something I'm told called Tasty, and that's it. Um, yes. <laughs> but with respect to life for most Russians, you, you quote a Russian oligarch as summing things up, uh, saying, quote, life will be simpler, there'll be less money, people will make do with less, and there'll be more paper in the sausage, which is I, I suspect an iconic quote that probably was drawn from Soviet times, more paper yeah. and sausage. But so tell us what it's like. Is the war evident? Uh, what sort of economic dislocation do ordinary middle class Russians, as you refer to them, uh, undergo? Yes, and I think it's that's very the distinction uh, of middle class Russians is very important. I mean, it's important to remember again uh, that a lot of people in Russia live um, below the poverty line. That a lot of Russians, um, a very small percentage of Russians, something I think like seven percent, regularly travelled abroad for holidays. For example, that's a really small number, and a, and a very small number were used to Western brands and consumer lifestyles. I've spent my career reporting in. Um, you know, across uh, across Russia, and particularly, I was a, as a commodities reporter, so I used to go to you know oil rig towns or coal mine towns, places that you know had very large populations, but were not um, you know were not very wealthy, and you would not see H and M or uh, you might might see a McDonald's, but even that um, wasn't so widespread. So that's an important distinction. So why we focus on um, the mood and the kind of experience of middle class Russians in Moscow is also because um, that is what the Kremlin is paying attention to. And that is, you know, that's where um, mood shifts are important and could be politically sensitive, though I would say other parts of the country as well, but, but that's one of them. So to give you a sense of um, uh, what M Moscow is like at the moment, you can kind of get into the shoes of a middle-class consumer on their, on their, you know, normal day. They... Um, would go to a supermarket um, in central Moscow, which looks pretty much as it always did. The Western goods are still there. You can buy your European bottles of wine, your um, foreign foods, your, your Western brands. Um, that I did not notice a substantial difference, except for the fact that the prices have gone up somewhat. Um, you can go down the street, pop into Benetton, pop into some other shops. I mean, that might have changed since I was there, but in November, I was. Uh, some of those Western brands were um, were still present. You can't go to Starbucks; it's changed its name. You can't go to McDonald's; it's different, and it, you know. Um, but there's not a huge there's not a huge amount of palpable change. You might go through a. Um, uh, one of the more luxury areas of Moscow and notice that some of the stores are boarded up now, you know, um, the really high-end goods are not being sold because it's illegal to export them from 
uh, what well, sort of the, the exports from Europe are banned um, in terms of luxury products. But again, you know, I, I would speak to um, uh, acquaintances uh, who would say, you know, I'd ask, well, so what's really changed about your lifestyles? They're like, ah, oh, there's a particular brand of whiskey that I can no longer find. You know, that's really annoying. Um, some English books that I can't get or I don't know, different things. Um, but that is a small, uh, a small impact. I, I did notice it in that, in terms of my own personal experience, my, um, mm, I remember traveling from uh, Europe to Russia in the 90s, and I would, we would always be asked by family members to bring stuff that, that people couldn't access, you know, basic goods, hair dryers, I don't know what. And uh, then in the 2000s, that stopped, and we never got those requests. My trip back in November was the first time that a family member actually said, oh, do you think you could bring me this, this? I can no longer find, you know, this particular cleaning product, this kind of thing. But it's not that that particular cleaning product doesn't exist in Russia anymore. It's that, you know, the Western high quality branded one doesn't, but the cheaper, less effective Russian equivalent does. So that's kind of the paper and the sausage problem. Right. That's the do-it-yourself economy where the Russians clearly are, are having to manufacture. I think, you, well, we'll get to this in a second, but... This is a wonderful quote by Alexandra Pro Prokopenko, who's a former central bank official. She's also a frequent contributor to Carnegie uh, Politica. She says, and I quote, there are these billboards with heroes of the special operation all over Moscow, but people are still eating fresh oysters. The war becomes this kind of TV show. And a lot of people aren't regular TV propaganda viewers. If you get what's going on, you either have to deal with it in your own way or help refugees and people who are trying to leave. It's a very, quote, non-public and personal kind of struggle. Does that pretty well sum up the, the sort of uh, difference between external displays of uh, protest? There was a New York Times piece the other day mm. on a sort of mini pilgrimage to a uh, statue of a famous Ukrainian yeah. poet in the wake of the disaster at Dnipro where almost 50 um, Ukrainians were killed, including children. Um, you don't see, uh, for obvious reasons, it's a repressive state. You don't see that kind of displays on the streets. Would you know that there was an actual war going on? It's, it's, very, it's, it's actually very hard to tell. Um, I think also Moscow is its own, is a separate beast and uh, the, the mayor's office is pretty aware of attitudes in Moscow, which has always been more liberal, more kind of Western oriented. Um, and so, yeah, there are uh, billboards, um, particularly sort of those bus stop kind of billboards where you see pictures of uh, portraits of soldiers um, and it will say sort of uh, our heroes, um, but it won't even mention the heroes of what? It won't mention, you know, the war that's actually happening. Why are there suddenly soldiers on billboards and why are they our heroes? Um, so uh, there are a few, you know, the Z has become the kind of logo of the war in many ways. Um, I think I saw maybe two on buildings in my entire time in in Moscow. So I, I think that's also quite, um, quite limited. Um, one person put it to me um, as, as if, um, and I just thought the image was actually, is, is actually quite right. If, you know, from a Russian, specifically from a Russian perspective, it's as if a, a nuclear bomb or an atomic bomb went off in Ukraine and the shockwaves haven't yet reached Moscow. You know, they hasn't yet reached Moscow, but the radiation has. And it's seeping through and it's there. You know, the, the effects are happening within families, within people's minds, within their, you know, really, you know, on a really personal level, on a moral level, on a psychological level. But the actual shockwaves, the ones which, which will come slowly, uh, have not yet hit. I think the one noticeable thing for people on a daily basis is empty desks. So you go to people's offices or you talk about their office spaces and it's just a symbol of the, the many people who have left. And, you know, estimates for how many uh, Muscovites have left vary, but it is, a very, it is a very large number and people talk about it all the time. Um, they talk about their children who've left fleeing mobilization or just people who've generally left. So sort of in some way, it's kind of sparser, the city. Do you suppose discontent in the uh, regions distant from Moscow 
um, would be more noticeable. I, I, I gather that's where large numbers of the partial mobilization um, recruits are coming from. I mean, you you, you didn't nice. get a chance to travel there. You were in Moscow, I, I suspect, only. But is there any sense of what's going on out there? Yes, um, we did do a, a bunch of reporting after mobilization started, particularly on um, the, if, you know, the mood in um, Siberia, in, in different regions, also among ethnic minorities, because Russia has a large ethnic minority population. And by all accounts, um, there was, uh, they were overrepresented in, because they tend to be overrepresented in, in, in terms of the lower class, um, because of uh, this kind of unjust society and um, there's also uh, they were also as a result overrepresented in um, the troops who were mobilized so we did a lot of reporting on that um, I have to say that for me personally I really thought that mobilization was a Rubicon that could not be crossed in terms of public opinion that this was something that people would not accept you know I understood this um Mm, the, this logic of, uh, you know, the reason why Putin calls it a special military operation, the reason why um, we, uh, why, why it has, you know, not shown that much um, in Moscow, for example, it's not so evident, um, is because of the need to keep the war at a distance, to keep people far away from it. It's something that's happening, like Prokopenka says, as a TV show somewhere, but it's not affecting our lives. And of course, yeah. mobilization brought it into people's homes. But one has to say 300,000 people in a country of 140 million is perhaps one of the reasons why it um, didn't reverberate in, in, as, in as big as a, a way as it as, as it did, because there are, as you say, in, in the regions, areas where large proportions of a village or a town would be mobilized. And people were in a state of shock for the first month and panic. But it seems to have also, people have acclimatized to it, adapted to it. Before we leave the issue of the economy and, and, um, and get to the issue of, of more discussion on, on Russian public opinion and the travails of reporting in Moscow and and um, watching Russia from afar, which also presents its challenges. You did some fascinating reporting on ways that um, the regime, um, techniques to evade sanctions. Um, and one of those ways was so-called parallel imports. I don't know whether you reported it or I learned it somewhere else, but the Russian equivalent of Craigslist, a veto, uh, it has all kinds of ads offering to import foreign brand apparel. They give the example, if you search for Gucci on Avito, you get 173,000 listings, which basically means you can import just about anything via former Soviet countries um, through the system of parallel imports. How, how does that actually work? Absolutely. Um, you can import everything. Um, I would say that those supply chains and logistics chains are not very stable. It's not very easy to build an economy on that. And we are talking specifically about consumer goods. Less, you know, it's a different conversation when it starts to be about industrial goods or microchips or things that could be dual use for the military. But talking about consumer goods, it is possible to get almost everything to the point at, that um, I think in autumn last year, there was a new release of a new iPhone and iPhone, you know, Apple has has stopped selling in and has stopped its partnerships with Russia as a boycott. But um, companies were, you know, telecoms companies in uh, Russia were even allowing pre-orders of iPhones in the country for the new for the new iPhone. And I'm told there was no issue bringing in and meeting demand for iPhones in in um, in autumn. How does it work? So I sp I've spoken to people who are involved in the parallel imports trade on the European side. Um, I, you know, it is a smuggling trade. It is illegal for, for this to be happening. But um, what the smugglers say is that, for example, what they would do, one of the techniques is to set up a, um, like a front company. You set up a European company that ostensibly has no ties to Russia and it's you know run by by people with European passports it will then purchase the goods necessary um, and uh, these will then be taken via say Kazakhstan or even sometimes via the Baltics 
via Belarus, um, via uh, the Caucasus into, um, into Russia. Sometimes it works a different way. For example, a company um, could link up with a, uh, a company in Kazakhstan. So for example, uh, say you have a, a company in Kazakhstan that used to order a certain type of, I don't know, computer software or actually hardware, let's say a computer hardware from, from the US. Now it starts ordering a hundred times more than it did the year before. And then, you know, the extra, all of this additional stuff that it, that it, um, that it now buys will, be, will go to uh, the company that needs it in Russia. So there are different ways to go about it, but most things um, find, find their way in one way or another. Um, I traveled recently um, from Tbilisi to the Georgian border and all along for the four hours um, of the drive uh, to the, sorry, to the Russia Georgia border, um, there was a just truck after truck after truck after truck just waiting to cross, you know, just <laughs> hundreds of kilometers of trucks waiting uh, in line. So it's uh, it's definitely that there are people will always, it's, you know, business will always find a way to to continue. People will always try and find a way to um, make money, whether it's putting mobile phones in suitcases and taking them across, or or things which are more complicated. There will be ways uh, to do it. Georgia, Kazakhstan, different countries are uh, implementing, um, you know, are attempting to, to control this or, you know, to, are very careful to try and follow sanctions. But again, private business is, is a separate uh, story. Right. And, and since there are a great many countries in the world that have not have chosen um, basically to hedge and sit on the fence, yeah. uh, not siding with um, those countries, um, I, I think there was one poll of the 10 most um, populated countries in the world, only one of them, the United States, is uh, fully on board with sanctions. So the Russians can depend on the Emirates, I suspect, on China uh, and on Turkey uh, for the import, not just of luxury goods, but a whole lot of other stuff as well. Um, yeah. So you, you, I think, there's one just example I found fascinating. I think it, it comes from your reporting, an example of the do-it-yourself economy and the rationalizations that accompany it. Um, I think you cite the example of chemical imports from Finland to bleach paper. Mm -hmm. So Russia stopped using the chemicals or making their own, turning the white paper, normal white paper, computer paper, grayish brown, um, which obviously isn't perfect, but it'll do. So one deputy uh, minister claimed that it's actually a great situation because new scientific studies suggest that shiny white paper is bad for your eyes. You know, it's a variation of the old Soviet, they pretend to pay us and we pretend to work sort of um, trope about what's actually happening. Um, you've also done great work on um, illicit grain smuggling. I wonder if you could say a word or two about that, and then maybe a word on the tanker trade, and we'll move to uh, to some political issues. Yeah, for sure. Um, the illicit grain smuggling, I think, um, is a, it's a specifically Ukrainian um, issue in the sense that um, we're talking about shipments of grain coming from areas of Ukraine that Russia has occupied. Um, so... Well, you know, areas um, of Zaporizhia, you know, around Kherson, um, all through uh, the summer. These, these are grain producing areas that Ukraine in general is a bread basket and very important for, very important for the world um, uh, in that sense. And when um, Russian troops came in and seized those territories, that strip of southeastern Ukraine that connects the Russian mainland to um, uh, Crimea, which it annexed in 2014 from Ukraine, uh, it started quite quickly after that to try and re-establish the grain industry there, which was obviously, um, you know, uh, quite destroyed by war. And a lot of the owners of um, farms and the owners of grain silos and, and kind of, of of the grain industry there left, and they fled the war or were forced out because um, the fighting was incredibly severe and um, so my reporting focused on what Russia is doing to be able to continue exports of grain from that area. And it's really representative of the other, you know, the other route. We've been talking a lot about parallel imports, about, you know, how Russia smuggles things in. And this is about how Russia smuggles things out. Um, 
the uh, the methods were are 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 are, are very um, diverse. But one of the things that we looked at was the establishment of a new company, a new grain trader in the region, and ways that in which it would um, get tankers to come to uh, occupied ports in Ukraine, hiding by not. You know, these tankers would switch off uh, their radar systems, this kind of uh, this AIS system that identifies its location. So you're not able to follow it anymore. It's there on the map and then suddenly disappears. And in that window, it arrives per our reporting in Ukraine, picks up this kind of looted grain and then starts taking it out into the market and, um, you know, arriving most of the time to the northern coast of Turkey or going to Syria, to Libya, that kind of thing. So that's that's these kind of ways in which, and, and some we've seen a lot of, for example, ship to ship transfers occurring globally. So that's, you know, a quite as if, if you can imagine two enormous tankers coming up next to each other in say the Atlantic or in the Mediterranean and trying to move grain from one ship to another, which is a way to conceal its origin or to mix grain. And the same thing happening with oil. This sort of stuff is on the increase. Um, on, on, um, on oil exports, uh, this is a very uh, important topic for Russia. As I said, it's in a huge part of the, of the budget. And um, there have been numerous, so there's a European-wide boycott, that has been that has come in um there is also the price cap that is operating so what we've seen is um a huge increase in the purchases by you know shadow entities that we can suspect are connected to russia of very old oil tankers you know right. tankers built in the 80s um that wouldn't be fit for use and normally would be shipped off to kind of the scrapyard but they're being bought to transport um, oil as a kind of large shadow fleet. Um, my colleague David Shepard has done a lot of great work on this. And um, some people are trying to start monitoring this, this shadow fleet of tankers, but it is really um, it is really growing. And this is a way that Russia will be able to try and continue shipping oil in various underhand ways. We've also seen tankers do things like throwing their AIS signal to different locations to actually hide where they are so one moment you see them going through i don't know the malacca strait and then suddenly they're in the mediterranean you know just juggling their location to 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 conceal um what's going on so yeah all sorts of different techniques are being used some of them adopted from the venezuelan oil trade some of them adopted um from the iranian trade there are lots of ways to get around a lot of ways to get around sanctions and and sanctions policy people that that we uh, hear from um, say that they see they understand that this is going to be a game of whack a mole for them for a long time. Right. There are two more issues I want to explore with you. Um, uh, how to get at the first one? Well, okay, let's try this. Ten months after Russia launched its full scale invasion of Ukraine, almost eleven months, uh, Levada, which is a credible independent Russian polling uh, organization, latest poll suggested some 70% of Russians support the war, all right? That's from Russia's most respected and independent polling organization. So I ask you to unpack this number for us. But before that, I'd just like a, a sense from you. There have been studies done by the World Value Survey and the International Social Survey Program that explain that Russian patriotism is really distinctive. They claim both organizations, and Russians feel a stronger obligation to support their country, right or wrong, than, pe than people in virtually any other country surveyed. They also, the Russians, according to the studies, expressed, consistently expressed a greater willingness to sacrifice their material well-being for their country's military might. Now, I don't know how valid this is as a, as a proposition to explain the absence of organized protest or the numbers, whether assuming that that Levada is being leveled with by the individuals they poll. Um, what do you make of that? I mean, I, I think um, I would, I, I'm always very wary of polls about values by nation and culture and, and this kind of thing. I do think that that's, I mean, they have a, they have a right to exist, but um, I, I, I slightly steer clear of that and stick to some of the practicalities. I think um, what 
I have heard discussed, and it feels broadly right to me, is that there are, you know, the 70% figure, you can see it um, in, in that way, or you can talk about uh, from slightly different perspective that there are probably 15% of people on either extreme. So around 15% of Russians are strongly against the war. Um, some of them have emigrated. Some of them, you know, are not speaking out, but because it is very difficult to do so, but, um, you know, are, are very um, uh, opposed to the situation. And a similar number are in you know, the ultra-nationalist extreme wing who are very, um, well, nationalist is probably the wrong word, but very pro-war um, wing of, uh, and you see them a lot in, on Telegram, for example, there's a very big kind of pro-war community that um, is based around kind of military bloggers who, who talk about what's going on in the front lines. So those two, two extremes in the middle are people, someone recently uh, described it to me as um, sort of indifferently loyal, um, people who uh, are, you know, broadly support the war, they follow what they're being told, they're sat passive and submissive, they're, they are kind of in a state of inertia, um, also some are affected by propaganda, I mean, the... Um, but that that is the kind of mass perspective the, the the large the larger contingent is not you know when we talk about 70 percent support the war i think maybe that's a little bit black and white there is um a large proportion of people who you know support it but potentially when pushed would would actually rather it would not not be happening sure. and that is and, and you know and that is not to um take away any moral responsibility from them for that but um there one way we can talk about it is, of course, uh, propaganda affecting people's understanding of what is going on. Um, you can respond to that by saying, well, people are not seeking out alternatives to propaganda when those do exist online, when you can still open YouTube, when you can still listen in Russian to people and voices who are critical of the war. But it's a question about whether or not the large majority of people, you know, people in that group in, in, in the middle um, who are very accustomed to just kind of following um, following the message um, that they are being given, uh, whether that group of people know that they can even open that door, you know, open the door that leads them out of the propaganda bubble. Um, propaganda is quite insidious and it makes people think that, that there isn't a different reality, that that is the reality in which they exist. Right. And I'm talking about this as if it's something external to me, but this is happening within my personal universe as well, you know, within... Um, structures of family or close people to me so it's something that you you witness a lot and um mm, i i would say that um this kind of lack of questioning perhaps of the received message is is definitely um yeah that's that's definitely uh kind of across happening across the board right. um if that support would still be there when pushed and this is the question around mobilization and whether you know once it comes to your own family I think that's I think that's probably a very different picture. But as an analytical conclusion, it seems that any sense of a massive protest, serious tensions, challenge challenges to the regime, challenges to Putin, inner circle, the broader public, um, that's a much longer story um, based on on your own in, intuitive. Um, analysis and your reporting and Moscow I would say, is yeah. with, with anger and resentment against the war it's certainly not being publicly expressed and it may not even be privately held this notion of indifferent supporting it indifferently I think is probably it's bleak in many ways makes sense um, well I think but it's, bleak, yeah. but it's real and we need to be realistic this may not be a forever war but the notion of abrupt changes in, internally in Moscow to force a course correction seem to be wishful thinking. I, I want to conclude. Um, you were in Moscow reporting. Now, you, were, you write in English, which I suspect gives you some greater leeway and flexibility to report. Um, mm -hmm. But as you see it, the, the space for... Um, objective reporting is constricted because your sources 
are under greater pressure? Have you noticed much of a change in terms of the way people behave? Is it, are we going back to the Soviet era where people are whispering and taking walks in the park instead of talking um, anywhere inside? I mean, uh, yes, uh, to, to a degree. I, the, 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 conversa the, the, the term democracy in one kitchen, which was the, you know, this notion that you can only speak freely at home, um, I heard that term used uh, a lot. That's I mean, me. some way lightly, sometimes not. Um, I think there is definitely a paranoid atmosphere at the moment. I don't know the extent to which it is uh, necessarily justified, um, but uh, there is definitely a sense of fearfulness among people. I, um, uh, the way that the repressive apparatus works is, I remember seeing a, a protest, this very clearly in a protest in Moscow, where people, um, where people stand, you know, they, they've got their slogans, they've got their banners, they're standing in a protest. This is years ago. I mean, obviously there are no mass protests now, but, um, and the police would come in and they would select people out of the crowd. It's not they were rounding everybody up. You could stay there if you wanted to, but you knew that one person out of every 10 was going to get taken out and get detained. Now, what the government makes you think is, you know, are you going to keep standing there? How long are you willing to stand there waiting as, as people are being picked off? And it's yeah. the example that's being set. So you don't need mass arrests and mass detentions to frighten people. All you need is people, you know, as cases and examples that will uh, make people genuinely afraid, which is why we don't necessarily see a huge amount of um, actual long-term arrests. We saw a lot of detentions of people um, in the first uh, sort of in the first protest, there were initial protests against the war, and we saw a large amount of people detained and, and released after a few days. But some were then jailed for or given long-term jail sentences, or threatened with you know six, seven, eight-year jail sentences. And those examples are enough to kind of make everybody think, well, am I going to stand here and 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 wait to be the next one? So right. I think that is is also how it works. Um, in terms of, uh, yeah, so in terms of whispers and fear, yes, there definitely is a, a new, a newer level of um, people feeling uh, that they are, at, could be at risk. One final question about bias in reporting. You, you gave a fascinating interview to Carnegie Politico. Um, and I, I would suggest everybody listen to it. It was in, called Watching Russia from Afar. And you made the fascinating observation with respect to personal bias that it's always harder to start. I love this. It's always harder to start with a question than with the answer. And I just wonder, um, and reporters, you know, we're all sum totals of our own personal experiences. The best we can do is step outside of ourselves, recognize what those biases are, and, and then try to report objectively. Do you think that's a problem in the way Russia is covered? Hmm. I mean, I, I think there's definitely, um, it's definitely important to uh, hear um, from people who have reported on Russia for a long time. I think that it, it's, um, it's critical to, uh, it's critical to listen to people who have entered the Russian mindset or not Russian mindset, but to, to enter the kind of uh, information bubble that exists. And um, I sometimes uh, am, a, you know, at home uh, or, you know, not in Russia. And uh, you feel yourself kind of entering that information space when you go into those telegram channels, when you only talk to people in the country, when you um, use social media that, uh, and, and read only kind of state media headlines and you start entering a certain worldview and you start kind of feeling through your skin what it is like to actually exist in that information space and how it makes you feel, what political views you might adopt um, when you were in that bubble and when you were receiving that kind of information. And it's very, and then you can sometimes, and then you, you know, switch off your laptop and you exit it and it's almost like a sort of physical feeling. And uh, so that's to the question of whether it's possible to report from abroad. Uh, yes, this is the way that, it, that you do it. But um uh, I do think that it is important to pay attention to people who are doing that because that transition from one worldview to another, that it exists, or at least from one information space, from one kind of bubble of, of um, conversations and dialogue and the kind of things that you're seeing in the news to what you see 
when you exist in in right. in the West is very it's just very different. Um, I, I would, and so uh, you you might misjudge people's reactions or, um, yeah. Right. I would only conclude, Polina Ivanova, by saying that you definitely don't start with the answers. Your reporting suggests you start with the questions. And frankly, <laughs> not to editorialize, but I would borrow that line, frankly, and and challenge uh, uh, folks here to approach subjects by beginning with uh, a question rather than the answer. But thanks so much. Um, <laughs> Thank you. you report with authority and expertise and it's truly ground truth. You made me and I'm sure uh, many Carnegie Connects viewers and listeners a lot smarter. So good luck and uh, uh, maybe after your next trip um, later in the year, we'll get you back to talk more about impressions. Thanks again, Polina. Thank you terrific. so much. Thanks for your time. Thank you. Take care. Bye-bye.